Hey everybody, welcome back. Uh, this is Mr. Miller once again. Who else would it be? Uh, and I'm here on a, uh, I guess this is a Thursday, uh, and it's the 28th of May. Thursday the 28th of May. Uh, this is going to be our final notes video for the week. Uh, we're going to pick back up with notes on Monday and Tuesday of next week. Uh, and then I think we'll be done with notes actually for for good. So that's kind of exciting. We got three more coming today. Three more days of notes. Um, just a quick reminder: if you're still turning in work for marking period five, you need to do that by uh, the end of this weekend. I would prefer things by Sunday, uh, Sunday the tw the thirty first. I guess it would be. Uh, so then I can get those grades put in. Uh, and, and finalized by June 1st, which is the deadline that I've been given. So uh, just a reminder, get those things into me. Okay, so without further ado, let's get into uh, our notes for topic 19 and 20. Uh, we had left off yesterday with Bill Clinton and his impeachment. Uh, Bill Clinton was president, he got reelected in uh, 1996, so he was president for eight years uh, until 2000. Uh, there was an election in 2000. Now, 2000, uh, the 2000 presidential election is the uh, interesting, uh, the interesting thing for the day here. Uh, the 2000 presidential election happens to be one of the wildest and craziest elections. I'm trying to get my seat organized properly. One of the wildest and craziest elections that we've had in our country's history was in the year 2000. Uh, it's very, very strange, and it's kind of interesting and enjoyable to talk about. So we will do that. So, uh, the election of 2000 faces off between, or I guess faces, uh, George W. Bush, George W. Bush, remember we had uh, George H. W. Bush, George Herbert Walker Bush, uh, his son ends up running for president in 2000, uh, his son is George Walker Bush, George W. Bush. So there's two of them, George H. W. and George W., but we're talking about George W. in this case. So George W. Bush, his son, runs for president. He is a Republican from Texas, and he faces off against a uh, against a Democrat, uh, actually uh, Bill Clinton's vice president. Uh, his vice president was named Al Gore. Al Gore. So Al Gore is uh, Clinton's vice president and a Democrat here. Uh, Gore is seen as kind of he's an okay guy. Uh, he he is. Uh, not as personable as George W. Bush is. So Gore, he's got kind of uh, following in the footsteps of uh, following in the footsteps of uh, Bill Clinton. So people like him for that. But George W. Bush has this this uh, kind of persona that that people really can uh, resonate with. Uh, a lot of people would have said back at this time that George W. Bush is the sort of person that you could, you could, uh, you know, just sit around and have a drink with. That's the type of person that he feels like. That's he's just a good old boy. That's kind of George W. Bush, uh, in a lot of people's opinions here. Now there is another guy who runs for president, and he's a guy who we've already talked about. Uh, we talked about him in the context of the 1960s and 70s. Uh, this guy wrote a book about uh, about seat belts in cars. Uh, the book was called Unsafe at Any Speed, uh, and his name is Ralph Nader. Ralph Nader. He runs as a member of the Green Party in this election. Now, he doesn't ultimately get a lot of votes, but he gets enough votes to cause some issues here. So. Nader steals some votes away from Al Gore. Okay, so keep that in mind. Nader takes some votes away because Nader is even more liberal than Al Gore is, and Al Gore happens to be uh, needing those votes. Okay, oh, I should also mention Al Gore had a famous documentary called An Inconvenient Truth, uh, which is about uh, global warming, and that's kind of his, uh, his deal. Uh, that's what we kind of remember him for. Uh, so, here you can see the uh, breakdown of the popular vote and the electoral vote. Remember, popular vote doesn't ultimately matter. Uh, it's how many electors in the electoral college do you get. It's been a while since we've looked at one of these maps. So popular vote, uh, Al Gore actually gets 500,000, half a million more votes than George W. Bush does. But George W. Bush won uh, some major states, and those major states ends up getting him to the point where he ends up uh, ends up being able to be elected. But uh, before we get to that final statement there, that George W. Bush wins, because yes, he does win. 
Uh, before we get to that final statement, okay, this election, when all the votes come in, this turns into a bit of a crazy election. There are some states, even though uh, Al Gore has 500,000 more votes than George W. Bush, there are some states uh, that are too close to call in some states that they're not sure how many votes one person has versus the other. Uh, it's too close, they got to do some recounting. So the main state that we've got to talk about here uh, was the state of Florida. So Florida down here in the bottom, uh, I hope we all know where Florida is. Uh, it's the warm spot in our country or one of them. Uh, Florida has 25 electoral votes and if Al Gore gets those votes, he wins. If George W. Bush gets those votes, he wins. So Florida happens to be very, very close. Now, the problem lies in Florida. Uh, they got to the point where uh, they got to the point where Bush had won Florida by less than 1,000 votes. Okay, millions of votes were cast in Florida, and Bush wins by 537 votes out of out of many million. Okay, so that part's crazy. So what, they, what do they do when things are that close? They recount things. Okay, so they order a recount to, uh, to be able to figure out, okay, who actually won. Uh, needless to say, uh, that lead shrinks a little bit and it gets even closer and closer and closer uh, as this recount is happening. And then uh, all craziness kind of breaks loose here. Uh, because it is realized that one specific county in Florida had an issue with their voting. Okay, and that county is uh, Palm Beach County, which is uh, listed on this picture. Palm Beach County had used a system of voting. This is back before, like nowadays, if you go vote, nowadays you just kind of bubble things in and it's like a Scantron that you send in through this machine and then it counts your vote. Uh, so it's just basically like a Scantron. Uh, you may remember back in the day having like tabs that you pull down and then you have this curtain. Maybe your parents took you into, uh, into a voting booth back when you were a kid. I remember my parents did that. Uh, that is not also not what they're kind of using here in, uh, in Florida, or at least in Palm Beach County. Uh, in Palm Beach County, they used a type of ballot that is called a butterfly ballot. Okay, and it's called the butterfly ballot because butterflies have wings uh, and then kind of this main body of them uh, that's where all their vital organs are. So it's kind of like two sides connected by a little, a little tab, right? So it's a butterfly. So this is a butterfly ballot. You've got this, uh, this tab in the middle that is this yellow strip uh, with all these holes in it. And then you've got voter or votes on each side or people's names on each side. Okay, and that's what they call a butterfly ballot. Now, what you would do is, uh, back to this here, you would put in a punch card, okay, where it says insert card here, all the way at the top of that picture. Uh, you'd put in this little strip of paper, and the strip of paper would have your name on it and all that information, and then that's how you would vote. But what you would do is you would vote by punching out the uh, name of the person or the corresponding area uh, of the person that you wanted to vote for. So you take this little punch tool over here, which is on the right hand side connected by that chain. It's just a little plastic thing with a little metal tip on the end. Uh, and you would punch out whatever hole you wanted to vote for. Uh, so it seems pretty easy. And then you take that out and then it reads into the machine and it says, oh, we're missing a, a piece of paper for Al Gore. So you meant to vote for Al Gore. Okay, great. That's, that's kind of how it's supposed to work. The problem is, is that these ballots happen to be very, very hard to read for normal voters in Palm Beach County. Okay, George W. Bush. If I want to vote for George W. Bush, I would go ahead and punch the top button there, the top spot, and I'd just punch that out. Okay, that's great. Now, what do I do if I want to vote for Al Gore? Okay, oh, well, he's the second one on this list, so I go over to the second spot. And I vote and I punch that one out, okay? And then I voted for Al Gore and I turned my paper in. No, that's actually wrong, okay? If I wanted to vote for Al Gore, I had to go down to the arrow that points to the third bubble, okay? The second bubble is actually a different guy, Pat Buchanan, okay? Pat Buchanan, whoever he is, we've never heard of him before. Uh, if I accidentally just pick the second spot because Al Gore is there and I don't pay attention to what I'm doing, I'm going to end up picking Pat Buchanan as my presidential vote, okay? Now, you might say, uh, 
how is this even going to matter? Nobody's going to do that. Everybody's going to pay attention to these numbers. Okay. I want to direct you to this chart. Okay. This chart is uh, a chart of Pat Buchanan uh, votes in Florida. All of the counties in Florida are listed on here and it's, uh, it shows how many votes Pat Buchanan got in those counties. Okay, in every single county, Pat Buchanan, uh, every single county except for two of them, Pat Buchanan got less than 1,000 votes in those counties. There was one county where he was just at about 1,000, all the way over here on the right, or I guess the second to the right. And then Palm Beach County, he got almost 3,500 votes. Okay, those are what most people would call overvotes. Votes that were not meant to go to him, but people made a mistake and voted for him on accident. Okay, so that part kind of shows, oh, hey, you know, uh, if you take those, if you take those 500 votes, even, even if you take a thousand of those votes away from Pat Buchanan and give them to Al Gore, uh, Al Gore would have won Florida. So what could have been? I don't know. It's kind of interesting. Okay, so overvotes in Palm Beach County. Now, there are also, and I'm almost done with this, so I've been talking about this for 10 minutes, but it's a very exciting thing for me. So uh, we talk about this. So uh, when these votes get put into this big pile for the machine to read, there are a bunch of votes that are unreadable, okay? The voting machine required uh, for uh, the entire punch out, okay? Imagine, imagine you're doing like a hole punch and you know sometimes you push down the hole puncher and sometimes it doesn't punch the thing all the way out. It doesn't punch that little circle all the way out of your paper. Okay, did you punch it? Did you not punch it? Sure, you punched it, but did you punch it completely? No, because it didn't come all the way out. Well, the same thing happens here in Palm Beach County uh, and in other places in Florida too, but Palm Beach County is the main one that we got to talk about. So when they go and they punch out those little circles where they had to vote for, sometimes they don't punch the, they don't punch the paper completely all the way through uh, to the point where they remove the little piece of paper from the ballot. Okay, so those are what we would call hanging chads. Okay, hanging Chad. Uh, this is not referring to uh, hanging an individual named Chad. That would not be nice. Okay, we live in 2020. We can't do that. We shouldn't do that. A Chad is a little slip of, or it's, a, it's that little punch out that you're left with. Okay, when I open up my hole puncher and I've got all those little circle wafers of paper, those are all called Chads, I guess. So we have hanging chads, which a hanging chad is just simply a chad that has not been punched all the way off of the paper. So here you've got uh, on this uh, paper up here in the top left or on this picture, you've got different examples of chad mistakes. Okay, uh, there is uh, two different or there's a hanging door chad. It's just connected by one little sliver. Okay, so the machine doesn't read it. There's a swinging door chad connected on one whole side. Okay, there's a couple different examples of those. There's a tri chad, just one corner has been punched out of it. There's a dimpled chad where you actually didn't punch all the way through, but you just got, you know, it made a bump. Uh, and the same sort of thing with a pregnant chad, the whole thing has kind of been bumped out, but not poked through. Now, the problem comes when you're recounting. Okay, when you do a recount by hand, you pick up the ballot and you look at it and you say, hmm, yes, this person voted for Al Gore. Uh, this person voted for George W. Bush. The problem comes when you pick up that piece of paper and you say, wow, I can't really tell who this person voted for because all they've got is this little dimple in George W. Bush's name. Does that mean I give them the vote for George W. Bush? Did they mean to vote for him? I don't know. Uh, they didn't punch the paper all the way through. Uh, what if the paper isn't detached? Uh, the rules say that they've got to punch the paper clean off. Does that mean that that vote doesn't count? I don't know. There's some fuzzy area here with all this. So this leads to, like I said, a hand recount. Uh, this guy down here, okay, this guy's super famous just because of this recount. Uh, he was a judge from, I believe, Palm Beach County, but uh, maybe a neighboring county in Florida. And he's called in to hand read these ballots and try to try to figure out what people meant to do when they were voting for these people. Okay, so they're trying to read through these things. Now, uh, 
he ends up giving like the best facial expressions and this guy's face was plastered across newspapers across america and plastered on uh, the nightly news on tv and he's just the kind of the poster boy for this recount because he's just got these big buggy eyes and he's like trying to look and see what these people meant to do and he can't tell so it's just it's just he becomes the poster boy for this so uh, i figured i had to throw him in there just because uh so what ends up happening here okay all of this confusion leads to a supreme court case okay there's a supreme court case in 2000 called bush v gore uh, al gore wanted the recount to keep going george w bush did not because george w bush technically had more votes to begin with okay and uh, this goes to the supreme court the supreme court rules that since there's really no way to accurately know how many people voted for who and uh, if those Pat Buchanan votes meant to go to Al Gore, we can't prove that uh, because they did, in fact, vote for Pat Buchanan. What to do with these hanging chads? There's just so many questions. So the Supreme Court says, stop recounting. No recounts. Done. Okay. Florida, stop recounting. Florida, you have to give your votes to whoever they are at right now. And that was George W. Bush. So Florida gives their 25 electoral votes to George W. Bush, and George W. Bush gets enough uh, votes to win the presidency. So there he is with uh, 271 out of, uh, he had one vote that he didn't need to get, one extra vote. He needed 270 and he got 271. So uh, that is, it's just a fascinating, fascinating election in 2000. So, uh, that's ultimately all I've got for you for that uh, number 10. Uh, hopefully you found that entertaining and enjoyable. Uh, it is a complex situation. So uh, now that George W. Bush is president, let's talk about him for a few minutes, okay? George W. Bush is uh, kind of, he kind of gets a bit of a bad deal, okay? And I'll talk about that in a little while. Okay, in a little bit of time, but um, to start with his domestic agenda, what he's doing here in America, okay? Uh, he passes a tax cut, a very big tax cut. Uh, taxes were doing pretty well in, uh, in uh, Bill Clinton's time. Uh, Bill Clinton actually was the last person, I believe it was Bill Clinton, uh, the last American president to oversee a tax surplus, meaning we took in more money than we spent in one or multiple years during Bill Clinton's presidency. Uh, I believe it was Bill Clinton, but it was right about that time. So uh, we had, uh, our national debt was not that much back back at that point. Uh, but George W. Bush cuts down the, uh, cuts down the taxes uh, because he viewed these high taxes as being uh, dangerous to our economy. So uh, they get called the Bush era tax cut. Uh, and they are 1.3 trillion with a T trillion dollar tax cut every year, uh, leaving more money in uh, normal people's hands, but also benefiting uh, the wealthiest Americans. So this contributes a little bit to a wage gap increase or a, a wealth gap increase. Um, and then this leads to the national debt rising. Uh, George W. Bush, at least as of uh, before 2020, I have no idea what 2020 is going to do to this because we are spending money uh, that we currently have no chance of having uh, to try to get out of this coronavirus thing. Uh, but before that, uh, George W. Bush had overseen the highest percentage increase in our national debt. Uh, he was like over the national debt more than doubled during his time as president. He went from like $5 trillion all the way to like 11 or 12. Uh, and then Barack Obama took it from like 12 to 19, something like that. Anyways, uh, that's just a, just a side note. So, uh, he also is responsible for, um, also responsible for passing a law that we kind of know of, maybe you know of it, uh, it's called No Child Left Behind, a program, No Child Left Behind, No Child Left Behind. You can guess probably what this deals with. Of course, it deals with schools. 
Okay, so No Child Left Behind basically says that uh, you have to uh, you have to perform a certain way to get money from the federal government in schools. So school performance. Uh, schools are mandated to keep track of their test scores. They're mandated to keep track of uh, their uh, teacher certifications, things like that. There's a school report card that's published every single year from each school district in uh, the country, I believe. Uh, and that school report card is meant to show certain things. And if those things are not adequate, then the federal government can cut funding for those things. So, um, yeah, so if, uh, the fed if a school doesn't meet federal standards, funding can be cut. So, No Child Left Behind, we are not into the time period of Common Core yet. Uh, that is not, uh, not included in this uh, conversation yet, but that gets there eventually. Now, also, I should mention that Bush, uh, back to what I was saying about Bush uh, not really having the greatest opportunity to do what he wanted to do. Uh, Bush is kind of... I don't know, he kind of doesn't get to do, he doesn't get a chance to, to change everything that he wants to change or fix the things that he wants to fix. He does want to try to cut down on entitlement spending. And by that, I mean like Social Security, Medicare, Medicaid, okay, payment for older people, but then also medical insurance for uh, Medicare would be for the uh, elderly and Medicaid for poor, uh, for poor people. So he doesn't really get a chance to cut down on those. He wanted to reform them because that's where the majority of our money was going in our national budget. Uh, so he wanted to cut back on those a little bit, but didn't get a chance. Mostly because of what we're going to talk about next. Uh, that would be the uh, war on terror here. So uh, George W. Bush, like I said, doesn't really get a fair shot in terms of implementing his programs because... Uh, just six months, no, eight months after he becomes president, uh, eight months after he becomes president, he has to deal with uh, one of the biggest crises that our country has ever faced, that being uh, the September 11th terror attacks. Uh, so September 11th, 2001, uh, just under eight months after he became president. So, uh, you know the basic details about the uh, September 11th terrorist attacks. Uh, there were four planes. Uh, hijacked on 9-11 in 2001. Uh, two of them hit uh, the World Trade Center buildings. Uh, world, there were two tall buildings there, uh, World Trade Center 1 and World Trade Center 2. Uh, both of those got hit by planes, uh, so we know that story. Uh, there was also a building over here that got uh, damaged that would be uh, called the Pentagon, and I have that up here. So the Pentagon the Pentagon was the site of the uh, military, basically, uh, the military uh, Department of Defense. They're set up in the, uh, in the Pentagon. So they crash into the Pentagon. The Pentagon also has the distinction of being the largest office building in the world, or in America at least. Um, it's a very, very large building, but it is five-sided, so that's why they call it the Pentagon. It also has five rings of offices in it. Uh, and those those uh, offices are five to six floors tall, so uh, or four to five four to five floors tall. So it's just a massive office building. Um, so with all that in mind, okay, so we've got these these attacks, and then there was one other plane that was taken down in uh, Pennsylvania. Uh, that one they assume was headed for either the Capitol building or the White House, uh, the center of the government. Uh, so they took out uh, the World Trade Center was uh, kind of the symbol of the economy. Uh, it's just down the street from Wall Street. Uh, so the economy, the military, and the government were kind of the main three targets there. And so uh, this is a really, really powerful story. And I think Mr. Shemel talks at de or in depth about this. But uh, Flight 93, the one where uh, the... Um, Patriotic Americans kind of overtook the cockpit or the cockpit and crashed the plane, uh, killing themselves in the process. But cash, crashed the plane into a field uh, down in southern Pennsylvania. So it's just a very inspiring, uh, very inspiring moment uh, to save countless other lives. They sacrificed their own. So uh, with all that being said, uh, the total loss on this day is just about three thousand Americans. Uh, 3,000, just under, it was like 29 something, uh, 2,900 something. So just about 3,000 Americans die. Uh, thousands more are wounded. 
Uh, now, who, who takes responsibility for this? Well, the group that we talked about yesterday who tried to bomb the World Trade Center beforehand, uh, Al-Qaeda. Uh, look up the video for yesterday if you need the spelling on that or look at your notes from yesterday in uh, number, uh, I guess that would be number eight. Yes, number eight from yesterday. So Al-Qaeda, uh, under the leadership of Osama bin Laden, claims responsibility for this action. So what do we do? Uh, within weeks of the uh, attacks at 9-11, uh, this was the deadliest attack on American soil ever uh, in, terms of our, uh, in terms of our death toll. So we have to respond. What do we do? Uh, we try to go get the, uh, the Al-Qaeda uh, terrorist group taken out. Now, uh, Al-Qaeda was gaining, or they had uh, kind of been given refuge in a country in the Middle East, uh, and this country is uh, Afghanistan. Afghanistan. We'll talk about Iraq later. But Afghanistan up here, uh, they are the country that is kind of harboring Al-Qaeda, taking them in and, and protecting them. And the government of Afghanistan is known as what they call the Taliban. Okay, the Taliban. So we go in and we say, okay, we've got to take out the Taliban because they're harboring terrorists and providing money for them and giving them all sorts of supplies and training and things like that. And we need to take out Al-Qaeda and Osama bin Laden. So uh, those are the two kind of major goals here, to get back at them for what they did to us, essentially. Now, uh, one interesting side effect of this whole war is that America needs to figure out how best to... Uh, how best to, um, I guess, how best to organize this whole event, this whole invasion, but also how best to keep tabs on people and gain information uh, that they might not have had about terrorist activities. Okay, so we got the realization that, wow, there's a lot of things going on in America and around the world that we do not have knowledge of, and we need to find a way to get knowledge of it. Okay, these people who flew planes into our buildings were training as pilots in America. Okay, and we may have been able to find out what they were doing if we'd have looked a little bit closer. Uh, so it wasn't really uh, it wasn't really understood completely. So what do we do? Uh, we end up uh, kind of advocating for a couple new things to be put in place that allow us to harvest information a little bit better. One of them is an item that you guys wrote about on your homework called the Patriot Act. It's sometimes referred to as the USA Patriot Act. Uh, the Patriot Act allows for, uh, allows for things like wiretapping, allows for things like extended surveillance of individuals who may or may not have bad things going on in their lives, uh, and we want to keep tabs on them. So we are keeping closer eye on those people through the Patriot Act. It allows for harvesting of information that we wouldn't have gotten beforehand. Now, you might question, oh, does that mean the government's looking at my text messages or listening in on my phone calls? Unless you give the government a reason to look in on your phone calls and watch your, or and follow your text messages, they're probably not going to do it, okay? You need to search things on Google and you need to be involved with certain people and then you'll get on their list, okay? I would not recommend doing that. Uh, but I'm saying that, that you have nothing to worry about. There's not some government agent watching me in my webcam as I'm teaching. If it was, it'd be massively ironic because I'm talking about how the government's not doing that. And if somebody was, that would be irony. Uh, but uh, it is not. So there you go. Connection. I get the eyeball connection for, uh, for English for the day. So uh, the Patriot Act is one of those things. Also, Homeland Security, which is there. The Department of Homeland Security, DHS is what, the, what it's uh, nicknamed. The Department of Homeland Security is meant to organize security efforts in America and try to find terrorists before they do things in America. So all of these things have the, uh, have the I guess, understanding that uh, our security at this point is more important than our personal freedoms. So you can see over here in this political cartoon off to the right, uh, there are government officials who are chipping away at the Statue of Liberty, the civil liberties, our freedoms in America, chipping away at them to use them uh, to launch against the war on terror. Okay, so I would say that that security and safety is a trade, or safety is a, is a trade-off uh, 
against your personal freedoms. Okay, if you want to live in a safe society, you have to give up some of your freedoms. If you want to have maximum freedoms, you're not your society's not going to be as safe as it could be. So everybody makes a decision in their minds, what is the boundary line? When is it too much? When are we giving up too much of our freedoms for the benefit of our collective security? So that is a trade-off that you've probably thought of before, or maybe you've not thought about it, but now you can. Um, now, also, okay, also, we end up invading, uh, we end up invading another country, that being Iraq in 2003, as part of this war on terror. Okay, so Iraq, we thought that uh, in Iraq, the leader of Iraq was Saddam Hussein. We talked about him yesterday, too, uh, in terms of the Persian Gulf War. Uh, so we thought that Saddam Hussein had things that we called weapons of mass destruction. They would be either chemical weapons or nuclear weapons, things like that, that would be massively destructive to anyone who, uh, anyone who may or may not run afoul or get on the bad side of Iraq or Saddam Hussein. So these weapons of mass destruction uh, was, or were kind of the main fear. Uh, now, we end up uh, invading Iraq in 2003, so two years after this war or this war on terror has kind of begun. Uh, we actually never find weapons of mass destruction in Iraq. We had decent intelligence that there was some, but we never found any. Okay, so we never found any, so maybe we went in there for no reason, who knows. But we did kick out Saddam Hussein, and he was a horrible guy, uh, and so we kicked him out and found him, or I guess trapped him and found him, uh, and then he was hanged. Uh, after, uh, I think he stood trial in Iraq uh, for all of the crimes that he had committed, and he was hanged. Uh, actually, he was hanged on my birthday, on December 30th, which is interesting. Um, it was like 2007, December 30th, 2007 or 2008. Uh, anyways, uh, they found uh, in Afghanistan, they found uh, Osama bin Laden. They actually didn't find him in Afghanistan. He, w he went on hiding for... Uh, just about 10 years, and he went to Pakistan, uh, and that was the uh, move that we had uh, SEAL Team 6 storm their compound and shot and killed Osama bin Laden and then took his, bo took his body away uh, from the compound. So uh, that was in 2011. Anyways, uh, this war on terror continues on. Even, I mean, you could argue it's even still continuing to this day. We are still involved with Iraq and Afghanistan uh, in some capacities uh, in America today. So we have continued this thing for just about 20 years. Uh, so this is the longest running conflict that we've kind of been in, uh, the longest running military, military event that we've been a part of uh, for almost 20 years. So uh, do with that what you will. Uh, I want to leave you with a joke. Okay, uh, it's a joke uh, that I heard about weapons of mass destruction. So uh, there was this guy walking downtown in New York City, and he was arrested. Uh, he was found carrying uh, he was found carrying a pencil, a protractor, a ruler, and a compass. Uh, any any guesses what he was arrested for? Yes, no, 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 no guesses, no guesses. Uh, he was arrested for carrying weapons of math instruction. Weapons of math instruction. Did you get it? Okay, hopefully you did. Uh, anyways, thank you for obliging me in my humor today. Uh, we have uh, a couple essential questions, so go ahead and answer those, and then we'll be back again tomorrow. So uh, I will see you guys back here again today. I'm just going to laugh to myself when I'm off the camera here. So see you tomorrow. <laughs>